I want to thank you for joining me today for a Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for these privileges and opportunities to gather before you and open up your scripture. We are so thankful, and we pray that it would continue to influence and grow our relationship with you and our love for one another. If we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you might remember, uh, as we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews, first of all, the author argues about the identity of Jesus. Ultimately, we've come to the conclusion that he is the great, the great high priest, the one and only great high priest, who the, the only person whose sacrifice for sin was effective. Everybody else was a placeholder until the real deal came along, and this is who Jesus is. And so uh, then he goes on and says, therefore, that's that little therefore button that you often use in, uh, in mathematical arguments, therefore, what do we say? Therefore, uh, hold firm. This is the section we've been looking at recently. And we're going to end that hold firm section today. We're going to move into the new section next week about faith. And we're going to see that transition taking place today because it starts here on chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. So the identity of Jesus, he is the great high priest, therefore hold firm to faith. But the question is, is why was that so important? Why were that means that people were basically falling away? Well, they were falling away because the identity of the people who were were the, the, the people who were the target audience, I guess you would say. So the target audience of the author of Hebrews were Jews who had converted to Christianity and they were going through a tremendous amount of persecution. And you're going to hear that as we start to read that. In fact, let's start to read this section and kind of get an idea of the type of persecution that they were suffering. Remember those early days, the author says, verse 32, after you'd received the light, and again, that's kind of a, a, a reference to receiving Jesus, okay? So after you've received the light, when you endured in great conflict, full of suffering, Sometimes, verse 33, you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. We have this perception that Christians were horribly mistreated in the first century. That they were regularly beaten and abused and thrown into the lion's dens, or as Nero did, dipping uh, dipping Christians in, in tar and then lighting them for a, a torchlit parade or something like that. These things happened. I'm not going to deny that they didn't. Christians were persecuted, but not as often as you think. It was not a regular thing. Most Christians could live their entire lives without any type of persecution whatsoever. The majority of persecution was not at the hands of Romans persecuting Christians and throwing them in the lion's den. Again, that did not happen very often. It was sporadic at best. Most persecution of Christians took place at the hands of the Jews against other Jews who had converted to Christianity. Now, that was a serious problem. And this is the concern of the author. You have now received the light. Don't turn your back on it because you're tired of the persecution that you're receiving. This is what his concern is. So there was some very severe persecution in Jewish territories against Jews who had converted to Christianity. And we heard the insults and the uh, uh, persecution that the author claims is taking place. And I, uh, this, this last section of, of verse 33 that we're at, at other times you stood side by side. Oops. Side by side with, uh, with those who are so treated. I, you know, I do kind of like this, this side by side. We kind of lose that in the United States of America because we are, we are so fixated on this personal, individual 
um, Jesus and me type of uh, relationship. We don't need the rap. We don't need to be go to church. We don't need other Christians. I just Jesus and me. So we've got this very, very pietistic, individualistic view of what Christianity is about, which is completely, by the way, non-biblical. Okay, in the Bible, there's no such thing as a private faith or relationship with God. It is always a public thing. We share it publicly, but we, we share it publicly with other Christians so that we can stand side by side. There are times I desperately need you in my life because I'm going through a hard time. I need you to stand side by side with me. And there are times in your life where you need me to stand side by side you. And if I've got this individualistic, pietistic idea of what faith is all about, I don't get the support that I need. Jesus made us for each other. So the early church got that. They were standing side by side each other. But again, there were some people tempted to give up their faith because they were tired of the persecution. You suffered along with those, verse 34, with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. Um... In the United States, we have, I don't know what else to call this, we have a persecution complex, some Christians. Oh, we're so oppressed. I hear this in particular from a lot of <laughs> very, um, I guess, ultra-conservative Christians who think that they are being threatened by the government and threatened by uh, this person and that person. We need to restore prayer into our schools. You know, you can pray anytime you want to in a public school. There is nobody preventing you from praying. Teachers pray. Teachers pray for their students. Students pray before they get to that test that they failed to study for. Okay? Nobody's stopping you from praying. But what I think people mean is, we're so persecuted because they aren't allowing us in the morning announcements to pray and read a Bible lesson. Why would you want that? It's a public school. We are a secular nation. And why would I want, I don't know, the Baptists reading that Sunday or that every morning uh, lesson and doing that prayer and teaching the Bible in school. Why would I want the Assemblies of God pastor doing that? Why would we want the Roman Catholic priest doing that? Why? Because here, why would we want a Lutheran pastor doing that? Okay? Do you see how that creates division? Because now we want, you know, we think it's a persecution complex because we are not getting the opportunity. Read the Bible in school. You can read your Bible any day in school. What you're prevented from doing is imposing that upon other people. That's not persecution. It's not persecution. You can talk about your faith all you want to. You can read your Bible in a public school all you want to. You can pray all you want to. You're not going to be allowed to teach it. Why would you want it taught there? And whose version of the Bible? I mean, come on. Don't you see? That's not persecution. We need to teach the Bible in our churches and in our homes. And nobody's keeping you from teaching the Bible in your churches and your homes. You are not persecuted. Okay? We are not. Oh, I know. The other example is, well, you see that, that baker that was forced and sued because they didn't make a cake for a gay couple. Well, who cares? You know what, to me, it's all about this. It's the Benjamins, man. It's not about, it's not about morality. It's not about, and they're coming in, if, if somebody's coming in, I understand. There are certain things I won't make. I wouldn't, if I were a beggar, I wouldn't make something uh, immoral that had to do with uh, uh, Adolf Hitler or, <laughs> or um, uh, that denigrated a certain group of people and so forth. Those things are bigger values. But come on, a couple that's going to be married and they're a gay couple, who cares? They love each other, so what? I guarantee you those bakers are making cakes all the time for circumstances and situations that they wouldn't agree with morally. 
So what? Grow up, get over it, because the overriding function of us Christians should be, oh, I don't know, this thing called love. Just love them. Just love them. Because once you X people out of your lives, we have no influence over them. <laughs> once, you know, it's just crazy. This is not persecution. Grow up, Christians. We are not persecuting the United States of America. You have not seen what true persecution is. You haven't a clue. Um, in some countries, China, pastors have to submit their sermons to the government before they're permitted to preach them. So it can be edited and reviewed for content. Well, that might be considered persecution. Same thing happened in Nazi Germany. They would regularly send government people into the churches to make sure the pastor wasn't preaching against the state in some way. I can preach against the state all I want to. Now, to be frank with you, uh, I mean, I've, you've heard me sometimes say some things that I think are immoral. And I don't understand why Christians are supporting particular political candidates. I don't sponsor particular political candidates. But I sure can speak out uh, my opinion, and this, the government is going to come and shut me down. Okay? I'm allowed to have opinions about these things. We don't, we're not being persecuted. These folks were being persecuted. The author goes on. Don't throw away, verse 35. Don't throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. You know, your confidence in what? Confidence in Jesus. He's just, again, he's been spending this whole book building up who Jesus is as the great high priest. Don't, don't give up that confidence in Jesus. It's not something that comes from inside. It's confidence directed at somebody else who we know we can trust and believe in because he is the one and only. Don't throw away that confidence because it will be richly rewarded. Verse 36, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now, you know, this sounds almost like a works righteousness. And I want to dis dissuade you of that. This is not a works righteousness. What I mean by that... Um, <clears throat> it means I do a certain thing, and as a result of doing this certain thing, I get richly rewarded. That's not what he means. But sometimes, um, how can I say, oh, I got a good example of this. It's like going to a football game. If I go to a football game, and I, I go to pick games, you know, usually, I haven't been going this year or we, uh, with our season tickets, but uh, I've had season tickets for Pitt since like 1995. Okay, and so I've seen a lot of really crummy games, and I've seen a lot of great games. But on a rare occasion, on a rare occasion, maybe two or three times, there have been some spectacular games where the Panthers are getting beat, and you know how we Panther fans are, same way Steeler fans. It's going in the last five, six minutes of the game, and the Panthers are down by a touchdown or two, a couple of touchdowns. The fans start leaving. Ah, I'm not going to sit and waste my time watching this game. I always sit and wait to the bitter end of the game. I don't care how bad the score is or what's going on, because you just never know. I guess I'm eternally hopeful about these things. On a handful of occasions... I've been very richly rewarded. So we start with 60,000 fans in the stadium. By the time it comes down, the Panthers are down by like two touchdowns five minutes ago. And like I said, I've seen this happen a couple of times in those years. And all of a sudden, the 60,000 fans, it melts down to like 5,000. And most of them are fans from the other team. I'm one of the few Pitt fans left. And Pitt makes a comeback and wins the game. That's happened a couple of times. I was richly rewarded for my faithfulness by staying there in my seat. Okay? That's all I had to do. And, you know, the same thing is true with our confidence in Jesus. We just hold firm. Don't walk away. Because by holding firm, you'll get to see this wonderful thing 
this blessing that God wants to, to lay out in front of you, okay? So he, you will receive what he has promised. You're going to see the blessing. Unlike the Pit Panthers who <laughs> more often lose in those situations, we know that in this situation, we're going to win. Jesus is going to win. All right, so verse 37. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come. He will not delay, okay? He's again, that's uh, for verse 37, the promise that he's going to win. He's coming. It's going to happen. Now, I will tell you, the early church, you know, this is kind of that, uh, uh, we confess this every single Sunday in our, our creed, don't we? About uh, Jesus in the second article of the creed, that Jesus will come again. We believe that Jesus will come again. Jesus will come. We, we believe that. We confess that every Sunday. Well, they thought it was quite imminent. Jesus is going to come any day now. Any day. When they said any day, like this week, Friday, next week, maybe a month from now, but they thought it was that imminent. The early church learned very quickly after waiting and waiting and waiting that we might have to settle in for a while. Well, it's been 2,000 years. We've been waiting for Jesus to come. It hasn't happened. Okay? Jesus has not returned. And I attributed that to something uh, for one reason. Because um, Jesus is, has hope when we do not. We've kind of given up on this world. A lot of Christians have. Not all Christians but there are some Christians, probably the same aforementioned, really uber-conservative Christians who are ready to give up on this world and want Jesus to come right now. And I just keep saying, why? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I know a year from now there's going to be other babies born. And 10 years from now. And 100 years from now. And 1,000 years from now that I think Jesus just wants to love. I'm eternally hopeful because I believe in Jesus. I think people who have been who've given up on this world and just want Jesus to come right now have given up hope. Don't give up hope, okay? But they did believe that Jesus' return was imminent. It didn't happen, but they thought it would come at any moment, and, and he wanted their butts in the seat, just like in the football game. Stay in your seat, just wait, he's coming. Well, he may come for you first in death, and that might take place long before Jesus will come again. But, make no mistake, Jesus is coming for you and for me. Author goes on, and, so Jesus will come again, he will not delay, and, but my righteous one will live by faith. He's talking about you and me. A righteous one will, take no, will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Have confidence in Jesus. Don't shrink back. Live by faith. I told you before, didn't I? They were going to move from the uh, issue of perseverance to faith. And this is the verse where we finally see that transition taking place while he's going to move to a new subject matter. So persevere, live by faith. This is how you're going to persevere. Living by faith, living by hope. But our faith, our hope is based in Jesus, not in the world, not in the politics of this world. Put it in the right place. So it is true, if you look at the politics of the day, if you look at the Republicans and Democrats in our country, I, I don't have a lot of hope. If I were to place my hope in, in a politician, I don't have any hope in, in progressives. I don't have any hope in right-wingers. I just, I just don't put my faith and hope in any of them. It's wrongly placed. My faith and my hope is in Jesus. That's where it's rightly placed, and this is what the author is trying to do. So we got we got to get with the program and put our faith in the right places. I mean, I think I think in particular we've seen this country just being ripped apart because people are putting their faith in the wrong places. I think both right wingers and left wingers are. It, it, it's just we're putting it in our politicians. I just saw one uh, 
one the other day, uh, a, a woman relishing in a, a prophecy that was made that Donald Trump is going to return to the White House in, 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 in 2024. Well, I'll say, good God, I hope not. <laughs> okay, I'm not rooting against or for uh, Republicans or Democrats here. I, I, hope which, I hope both candidates that we get are, are good candidates, but uh, we don't need that divisiveness. And why would we put, you know, on Donald Trump the mantle of the godly warrior. I mean, I, I don't get it. I just, I don't. Don't put your hope in politicians, any of them. Right wing, left wing, doesn't matter. We put our hope and we put our faith in Jesus. This is where our trust is. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 39. But we do not belong to those who shrink back. Don't shrink back. Have faith. We don't shrink back nor are we destroyed, but we are those who have faith and are saved. And so there's our transition. So now you understand the direction he's moving in. So once again, Jesus, the high priest, that is the first section. Have confidence. Don't shrink back. Second section. Therefore, how you're going to avoid shrinking back by putting your faith in the right place, leading us to this next section. I'm encouraging you today. Hold on. Have faith. Don't lose hope, but make sure you put your faith, your hope, in the right place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessing of Jesus. Jesus, the great high priest, in whom we place our hope and our faith. We know that we will not be let down. We may suffer persecution. <laughs> not likely in this country, but we certainly have Christians in other countries suffering through severe persecution. We know what it's like to have their rights revoked because they are Christians. <clears throat> Those who've lost their lives for being a Christian. We've seen that happen in Iraq. We've seen it happen in Afghanistan in recent days. We pray for the persecution, persecuted Christians that you would help them to persevere and help us to stand side by side with them. And that is true. We need to do so. But in our country, let us hold fast to Jesus. To put our faith in him. That we might persevere through the challenges of this life and be witnesses to your glorious love. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.